want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank Connections and Recovery for doing this. This is really an honor and a privilege and a pleasure. Anytime I get to talk about this uh, stuff in front of someone who is new and not my friends who are tired of hearing me talk about it, it's always really, really awesome. Uh, but thank you, Connections and Recovery. I also am really honored and privileged to be on a panel which, with colleagues that I actually call colleagues that I respect and just admire so much. So thank you, and I want to thank all of you for coming out. All right, so what are we doing? So well, here's what we're doing. <laughs> Patty told me I only have 50 minutes or she'll kill me. Dr. Fong says you got to stay behind the podium. I said, don't put baby in the corner. <laughs> and my friend Lynn told me last night at midnight I got to cut 40 slides. <laughs> Four steps for all. All right, so I want to go over some things, and I want to apologize because... This presentation, this is vast. I mean, you saw this. I want to remind you, this is 15 years is all we've been doing. this. I did not grow up with this. I'm what's called a digital immigrant, meaning I did not grow up. I grew up with a phone on the wall that had a cord and it rang and we either answered it or we didn't. Or my dad would say, don't answer it. It's the bookie looking for money. So that's how I grew up. I was a digital immigrant because I'm a Gen Xer, and at some point I had to bridge the chasm if I wanted to be a part of, if nothing more than my children's lives, because they are digital natives. So, there's a lot of information. Usually when I do this presentation, it's 90 minutes, and when I train clinicians, it's two days. I'm just going to give you an overview. I just want to show you some things. So I apologize if there's some questions you have. You can always hit me up, text me, call me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have coffee. All right, so some things that I want to go over. I want to read something to you that first that uh, I wrote as a proposal because uh, my first work was all in addiction. And so I worked in recovery. I've worked in recovery for almost 16 years. And my first research was all in that. And that's kind of what I did, and the first study that I did was a study about face-to-face -face versus online recovery uh, that was just published in January, and basically what it said was, uh, I proved that Alcoholics Anonymous works. It's not for everyone. There's lots of ways to do it. That study was a study of face-to-face -face versus online, and this little small study that I thought no one would care about became this big thing, but what came out of that was I started to look at relationships and communities. So the offshoot of that first study became the basis of this work. And so I'm going to read you something about a proposal that I did to try to get some money for a study that I'm doing now. <clears throat> On the internet, you can be whoever you want to be. If you're a loner with few friends in the world, you can make infinite number of friends online and feel you're no longer a loner. If you feel you accomplish little in real life, you can play an online game become a master at it, and convince yourself you have meaning. If you feel you have little control in your life, you can design websites, computer programs, and control whatever you want. Online, you can be anyone you want to be. And this can be addicting, and it can be dangerous. Online accomplishments should not be ignored. However, they should not overshadow real life accomplishments. So let's talk about healthy device management, and what I'm working on now, and I'm going to be talking about this, uh, I'm presenting at the APA conference in Washington, D.C. in August, if there still is a Washington, D.C. in August. And I'm going to be talking about what I'm working on now, which is really good digital citizenship. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you an overview. All right. So let's just throw out some things that we all know. Like if we're in geometry and they say, oh, well, here's the things you can use to prove the theorem. Let's just, let me throw, let me throw out some stuff. All right. So. If it isn't posted on social media, it didn't happen. Of course not. Uh, all right, so how did I get into this? So really all I got is I'd love to take credit. But I have to really give some credit to my daughter because about eight, nine years ago now, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon and we were going to the movies. And I said to her, let's go to the movies, we'll go to lunch. And I said, call your friends, we'll take your friends, I'll take anybody you want, I don't care. She said, okay. She starts hitting people up. And I said, okay, is anyone going? Oh, no, Susie has, you know, 
uh, some of their parents, and Jenny's got homework, and Beth is going to grab. Okay, all right. So we go to the movies. We have a great time. She and I hang out, we, and we come back, and she's sitting in the chair in the living room. When we get back, I go in the other room. I come back, and I look at her, and I can tell something's wrong. And I don't know what it is, and she will not tell me, but something is seriously changed. I try to talk to her, she won't tell me. Okay, so maybe it took a bribe at a shopping spree to Brandy Melville. I'm not above that, trying to get information on my kids. And then you were parents, you know what I'm talking about, so don't start judging me, judged her. <laughs> and she told me, and what had happened was that all those friends that she had called, who said they couldn't go, she saw a picture on social media, they'd all gone to the beach without her. And that started me thinking. All right, so the last 2.5 generations who ever knew face-to-face -face relationships are now walking this planet. We are the digital immigrants, the digital native. But the last 2.5 who didn't know are now walking the planet. And I'm worried that once we abdicate to the digital native and then they start teaching Gen CC624, whatever they become, that we have a, will have lost the people who knew what it was like to have a face-to-face -face relationship, to how to harvest one, how to cultivate one, how to do conflict resolution, how to be present, how to... I'm worried about that. Online, you're self-curated. You can be whoever you want. You can just present, you can create, and you can edit. So, is it real? I don't think that anyone ever thinks they're posting a bad selfie. <laughs> all right so what I'm worried about also the death of the narrative I'm worried about the death of storytelling I'm worried about the death of imagination this comes a lot in the stuff I'm working on with online pornography I'm worried about conscious contact and the loss of that I'm worried about the loss of face to face I'm worried about us looking up I'm worried that we're all going to end up regressing back to Neanderthals Okay, some facts, because we need them. 18% of children 12 to 15 years old have learned how to disable the internet filter. So don't even try it, because they're onto you. Because they're smarter than you, and they're ahead of you, and their friends and their peers who are 19 and 20 are the ones who created the filters, because they're the ones working in Silicon Valley. So I've got a hookup. How do I disable? I'm going to go on the internet and find a DIY how to do that thing out that my parents put in my... Yeah, so they're ahead of you. 40% of kids aged 12 to 15 can delete their browsers. Oh, let me see. I think he's looking at something. Oh, library. Oh, Mother's Day cards. Oh, no. <laughs> totally was going self. Totally deleted his history because he knows you're on to it. 29% can mask their browsing history. So 50% of parents say they don't even know how this thing works. That's going to change. Uh, what I'm worried about also is a concept of absent presence. We are all living in an absent presence. Absent presence means I am here, but I am not. Meaning I am on my phone, which means that I'm going to miss potentially untold number of memories to make, of conversations to have, of improvisational things that, wow, look, look at that bird. Like he saw. I'm going to miss the love of my life because I'm in the elevator. And this is not that rom-com where we look over and say, yo, what's up? <laughs> because I'm on my phone going, yo, what's up? I worry about this stuff. Okay, so technology has caused us to miss the bid for organic and improvisational connections. However, what do the experts say? Well, Bill Gates believes the minimum age for a child to have a smartphone is 14, and Steve Jobs banned iPads from his home. <laughs> Just saying. Let's go. Uh, okay. So, I think I got it. The tech guy can't figure out the tech. <laughs> it's not on is going to be what it is. Don't spoil. Oh! It wasn't on. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it wasn't on my fault. Not my fault. I know tech. I don't know, like, I don't know. All right. So here we go. Let's go. Now the most dreaded words ever spoken in the history of mankind are, guess it, here it is, what? Impossible. Now here's my first ethical moral dilemma. We all face it. Because we hear this. And we also, well, I know I should probably turn it off, but you know, what if the house burns out? What if the kids need me? What if that eBay auction goes on without me? Or what if someone tears off? Turn it off. But we don't. The zombie apocalypse probably ain't going to happen while you're in the hour movie. So we're going to talk about the good, the bad. All right, fun facts. America, you spend an average of 7.5 hours every day engaged with media. Most of this is multitasking. You all know it. I got this window open, that window open. I'm on my phone. I got music. I got all of this is happening, right? So what do you think those people in here who know, because we're in the neuroscience building, what is that doing to their brains? Brains are plastic. But this generation was hit with suddenly an influx of stimulation they'd never, ever had to experience before. They will adapt as we do. We're humans. It works. But I don't know what, how long it's going to take. So, heavy media multitaskers, poor memories, increased impulsivity. Oh, no one's seeing that all the kids are impulsive. Like, and it's not the sugar syrup. So, there's a lot of problems that we're seeing happen, and these are the facts that have to do basically with what the kids are using, how they're using it. So, during learning at school, at negative academic outcomes. Yeah, my kid will tell me, oh, dad, no, I'm writing my paper. And she's got nine windows open. Oh, it makes me concentrate better. Yeah, that's like when I told my parents I drove, I mean, when I told people that I was like a better driver when I was high. I'm more concentrated. So, no, they're not concentrating. And it's reflecting in their schoolwork. That's what he said. Okay, so I'm doing the math here. I think we're screwed. Because... What's going to happen in 26 years? <laughs> if it drops four year, four seconds in 13 years, we only have eight seconds left 26 years from now. And then we go into, what, a negative attention span? A lot of people accuse me of having that. It's not pretty. So I was at a conference, and I was talking about this. And I called it Media Saturation Overwhelm Syndrome. And I presented a paper because this is the problem. The problem is that when I was growing up, we had that phone on the wall. And it was, you know, a newspaper, three channels of TV. I was my dad's channel changer. Get up, change the show, you know? <laughs> now it is coming at us. And here's what it looks like. But here's what it looks like for me. So I'm just kind of looking at something. I'm like, OK. I'm sitting there, I see some on the news, and it says, okay, so rebels are causing an uprising in Istanbul. I'm like, Istanbul? What? Oh, hey, what did Istanbul used to be called? It used to have a different name. What was the old name? Shoot, I don't know. Let me go look. Like, oh, is Istanbul was Constantinople. Istanbul was Const Oh, look. Oh, wait, here's the video from We Might Be Giants. Istanbul was Constantinople. Oh, I want to watch it. Oh, that's kind of good. Wait, Ben Midler wrote that song, for, did that song first? Ben Midler. Oh, wait, Ben Midler just won a Tony for Hollow Dolly. I've got friends who are up for Tonys. Let me go look. Oh, my God, my friend Steve was nominated for a Tony. Wow, I wonder what Steve's up to. Let me jump over to his social media and say, I didn't know Steve was friends with Vicky. What's Vicky up to? Oh, my God, look at these shoes. I need these shoes. I got to go. Oh, wait, that's a pop up. I was just looking at those shoes the other day. Let me go back on that, and I'm on the shoes. I'm like, oh, you know, well, I think these shoes are too expensive here. Let me go on Shopify and let me try to see if I can find those shoes cheaper. Oh, wait, I can go and get a coupon for free shipping. And then I... Uh, five hours later. And I still don't have the shoes because I still think they're too expensive. I couldn't find the coupon, but I'll wait. But I bookmark it. And then the next day I'm like, Istanbul, what did that used to be called? And that's how it happened. Why am I so tired all the time? I don't know. I don't know. I was just like watching something on Netflix. That House of Cards is kind of cool. 13 episodes later. Or they're on videos. Or they're making a video. Or they're on... They're on Reddit. Reddit. Or they're gaming. Not a real thing. Didn't make it into the DSM-5. Thought about it. They talked about it. It's now called device management. It's like, if you want to be cool, because you're in this room, I'll give you a little something. Anyone who calls it technology addiction is like someone who lives, for those who in Manhattan, and calls it Houston Street. Yeah. <laughs> you know they're the bridge and tunnel crowd. So, it's housed in, by the way. So, 
don't call it that anymore. And I laugh at some experts because I'm real pissy because I do research and I'm legit in this and I'm serious and I see people and I see people talking about this and I was telling my good friend Reza, I'm worried because all these people are talking about it. But just here's your secret. This is your swag you walk away with. Do not call it technology addiction. That is so 2015. We're calling it device management. That's why the committee's named that, that I'm the chair of. Because technology addiction turned people off. Device management, we all qualify for. Here's what they called it. It's not in there. It didn't make it. Gaming disorders listed under conditions for further study. Shameless self-promotion. Uh, I got to be part of this amazing, brilliant think tank out of New York. Uh, we wrote the response to the condition for gaming. We asked. We, we responded to it. It's a really long, but Pediatrics Journal picked it up. They're publishing a special journal on it. Check the September edition. You'll learn everything you need to know about gaming. That's the end of the plug for that. But download it because it looks good, and then someone's packing the downloads. And the out <laughs> If you think you have it, or you don't, here's my test. Does this bug you? <laughs> if you are not affected by the Google spinning wheel of death, super cool, good for you, leave and come back for Dr. Smith's presentation, you don't belong here. <laughs> Wrong fellowship. However, if you see this and this thing spins and you start to spin and then you're watching and you're watching. Now remember, we only have eight seconds of, what? Oh, I forgot, that's right, attention span. Oh, I can't take more of eight seconds of this. Because I'm not built for it. I've got eight seconds. So I'm going to look at them. And, go, ooh, ooh. and then I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to start hitting a button. That's going to fix it. It doesn't fix it. Now I am royally pissed. Okay, so I'm just going to show it. And I turn off the computer. I'm going to unboot it. Ha! Boom. What? And I wait. Less than eight seconds, because I don't have eight seconds. I turn it back on. I turn it back on. It boots up like, ha, 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 psych. And it's the Google spinning wheel of death is still there. I'm like, damn. So then I just go on my friend's computer, and I just leave that. If that bothers you, if that made sense to you, stay. If not, come back for Tim's thing. Or this. I remember walking down the street like, wait, text. That's weird. I felt it. There's no phone. Oh, probably spasm. Walking down. My, what was that? If you feel this weird thing sometimes, or like your purse is buzzing, or your pocket's buzzing, and there's nothing there, no, you're not crazy. It's this weird phenomenon that's going on. It has to do, and Dr. Fong and the people in this building can probably tell you, it's something of a condition response that, that happens in your brain. Our brains are changing. We don't know what's going to happen. We might grow another ear just so we can have three devices. I don't know how it's going to evolve. <laughs> but if you feel that, yeah, stay. Otherwise... Come back. Okay, adolescents, teens, young adults, because these are the people I really like working with. These are the kids. So, how they were raised, how they socialized, brains developing and printing till age 25. Keep that in mind. Pinterest that over here, because we're going to talk about it. Okay, so correlation. This is the stuff the parents ask me about. Oh, what's it doing? Is it doing anything to my kid? No, the kid's fine. Of course it is. ADHD, depression, social phobia. All of these things, excessive long-term exposure is refiguring. Of course it is. They're being blitzkrieged with all of this stimulus. Oh, no, it's not changing anything. Of course it is. It will change. But right now, these are the, this is our guinea pigs that are doing it. We're watching what's happening. Now, about this slide, just one thing I need you to notice. I need you to really see what kind of a tweaker I am. Brains and coffins, an entire <laughs> night. Finding them, placing them, moving them. I just want a little moment of appreciation for the brains in the coffins and the eyes of the Jewish bullet points. Because as I tell Reza, if it's not worth doing right, it's not worth doing. Which is why I don't sleep. Because I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I can't do both. Brains and coffins, some appreciation. I did this and showed this at UC Boulder a couple years ago. A guy last week called me and said, you know, you had me at the brains and coffins. I said, I like you already. <laughs> All right, what are we going to do? Don't do that. That's not what you do about it. This is true. I'm not going to show you the picture of it. You're all looking it up now, aren't you? Don't. You could do this. I talk about this. this is what I teach. This is what I train. All right, smartphones. Yes, we do. 110 times. We put them by our plates. Yes, you know you take them in the bathroom. My friends say, well, I always take the newspaper in the bathroom. I take my cell phone. I say, ever drop your newspaper in the toilet?
We keep them with us all the time. Okay. Uh, this is my throwback Thursday. I did admissions for a rehab for like 10, 12 years. I think I had every one of those phones. And everyone was the must have coolers. That razor was the bomb. <laughs> It was so cool, the Blackberry, it's a Crackberry. <laughs> yeah, it is, but guess what? Ooh, Apple, hello, bye, Blackberry. I don't know, I think an hour's long. People can't wait to get out of groups. Clients can't wait to get out of the groups, can't wait to get out of class. Can't... They're all on their phones. Really, you don't believe me? You're checking it right now, aren't you? I see you. <laughs> so, because the Chinese are really progressive, and they really are on top of this, they said, well, we want to have this, like, we're going to, like, be cool with this. They just created a lane because they got so tired of people, like, walking like this and running into each other and chunking. They said, okay, screw it. We'll just, like, fine. Like, they all, we'll just build them a lane. Here, stay in your lane. That poor girl up there does not even know what's coming. She does not have a phone. This guy's coming in hot. She's about to go down. She's in the wrong lane. Okay, well, Utah, this is brilliant. They had all the students going up and down the stairs, falling all around. Okay, everyone, let's give them their own stairs. Walk, run, here's your tax lane. I saw this on Wilshire Boulevard. I was driving to Resolutions, and I see this, and I see this, and you guys see this all the time, but this one really, really upset me. This woman is not even looking at the traffic coming at her. The baby's like, ah, ah, ah. All the baby's missing is like an iPad going, ah, ah. What is going on? Honey, honey, you ever driven Wilshire? Driving down Wilshire to Resolutions for me is like being in a video game. There's like cars coming, bike coming, helicopters coming down, police. She's walking. I'm like, honey, you got you got a baby on board. So this is what I'm saying. Just for a minute, can you try it? No, they couldn't. I sat there and watched these two ladies. They met, hi, I've seen you so long. Oh, I love you so much. They took a selfie. They posted it. They sat down. The ocean, by the way, is right beyond that bus. This is in Santa Barbara. And they sat on their phones the whole time. And then it was over. I really sat and watched these people. And when it was over, they got up and they said, oh, so good to see you, see you again. One more. Okay, bye. I was like, they didn't even talk. Unless they were doing the thing that the teenagers do where they're sitting next to each other, texting each other from the couch. Like, what? what? Tension. <laughs> well, Ikea got on it, too. See, everyone's going to bed. This was real last Christmas. This was the must-have. Yo, I ain't got a problem because I keep spilling my, 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 my drink on my, my phone at dinner. Oh, we'll fix that. Here's a phone pocket. <laughs> this is real. This happened, people. You're laughing because you know it did happen. And then there's this. Okay, so here's how this looks. I can't. I can't with this. So remember I told you that there was that phone on the wall when I grew up? We didn't know who was calling. Could be a friend. Could be someone calling to tell me they were going to break my dad's legs unless he paid him. So we didn't know. We just had to answer the phone. And sometimes we disguise our voice. So... Or we made prank calls because no one knew it was us. Your refrigerator running? <laughs> Go catch it. I don't know when this happened, and I am victim of this. I'm telling you guys, if a phone call comes up and I don't have a name, I'm like... And I, so I did this. At, I did a paper at another conference, and I called it the Fear of the Unknown Caller. And then I realized what the acronym was. And it's perfect because it's exactly what happens. When I look at my phone and it's an unknown caller, I go... <laughs> who is it why are they calling it's so selfish like why don't you want me to know you're not calling me you're calling me why don't you want me to know and then I look at it and I have to, I, my whole life stops and I have to wait and hope it goes to voice so I can find out who the heck this is and I hold it and I don't do anything I'm waiting okay okay well they're leaving a line okay voicemail okay who is it good afternoon this is AT&T we're just calling to check out but I have it. I will not answer a call that doesn't have the name. What is that? When did that happen? Okay, so here's the good thing. The good. So there's all kinds of apps and things. You can set timers, take yourself off of it, block yourself out of the internet, watch your kids, spy on your kids, stalk your kids. You can do this thing. This thing in the middle is companion. Brilliant from my alma mater, some kids at the University of Michigan. 
created this app that helps college uh, students, usually women, designed for women, to walk home. If you're in the library late at night, it will walk with you. If something happens or the phone doesn't, they will send in campus police. That's cool. This is an organization that helps with cyberbullying. That's my own boot camp. That's a seven-day detox. And that's One Recovery, which is uh, owned and started by my friend Lynn Peterson, which works with kids. And if you don't know it, you need to know it. So that's, these are the good things to help rebuild community. Try to get all, yourself off of uh, the, the internet as much. Try to monitor and also monitor your kids if they need it, because sometimes they do. And when the parents say, well, I don't want to invade their privacy, I say, who pays for the phone? I'm not saying invade their privacy. I'm not saying read their diary. But if you're worried, investigate, because bad stuff happens. That's a family out at dinner. We had a great time at dinner. We all put where we were. Family dinner. And the kid said, don't you post me. Don't you tag me that I was at dinner with you. Don't you. <laughs> Parents like, we went to dinner. At da, 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 with the, and she's like, you tagged me? That's so uncool, Dad. <laughs> Secret decoy apps. Parents are like, oh, my kid has nothing on their, computer, on their phone. It's perfect. I say, click the calculator app. What are you talking about? Click the, Dr. Grant, click the calculator app. And behind the calculator app is the whole portal to all of the stuff that the kid's been doing the parents don't want, but they disguise it as a dummy app. They're really crafty, these kids. This kills me. This was the other day. This is this find my friend version of Snapchat. Oh, let's just find out where everybody is. I'm going to show you this thing on the end. This was just this week. And this scares the heck out of me because, yes, I want to find my friends, but... What are the implications of this that you can, that everyone can tell where you are? If you're a kid who's having a hard time or your kid is being bullied, and those bullies know where you are. Or if you're a girl that a guy kind of has like some kind of weird thing about and you don't know it and he knows where you are. Or if you're on vacation and your house gets robbed. Sorry. It's the bad stuff. Swipe white to bin. That means you're going to break up with someone. You want to break up with someone, just put in his or her name, and Ben will do it for you. That is so lazy. Like, I don't ever, I can't even be bothered to ghost them. Here, Ben, just like break up with Susie for me. Boom. It'll send Susie a text. Don broke up with you. <laughs> Peace. <laughs> Audrey and Daisy is this Netflix, and uh, one of the things One Recovery did was a panel about it. And if you don't know what it is, you should know what that is. Again, I'm sorry this presentation's fast. I'm giving you some stuff, but there's, this is, I'm telling you things to look out for, things you should know, but you should know what that is. Because there's 13 reasons why that One Recovery also just did a panel about that I got to be a part of. This is going on. This is real. One of the things that's the darkest, darkest, is cyberbullying, sexting, pictures that are taken, girls and boys even, but girls mostly sending pictures, naked pictures to boys in high school. The boys are collecting them and rating them and sharing them. <laughs> So that's one of the problems. And then that was a real Facebook post. It made me cry. Do I have any real friends? This was someone that's one of my friends. Friends? I don't know what they're. I don't know this person, but they're on my Facebook. This is important. So behind the veiled cloak of mediated communication, meaning on your phone, when you're not face to face. There's something called the online disinhibition effect. And what that means is that I will say and do things that I would never be able to do or wouldn't have the courage to do face to face. You see this a lot. You ever seen those vitreous threads on Facebook? Like, okay, shut up already, people. Like, enough. But behind that protection, we will do and say things. And it's called the online disinhibition effect, meaning I become more disinhibited. And bad things can happen, and people can say bad things, and kids who were bullied, it can go to extremes. Because what my feeling, and I'm going to show you what I mean by this. These are just the stats on bullying. But my feeling about it, oh, sorry, this slide came out a little bit. Um, it's what it causes. There were just two more girls killed themselves over some cyber aggression a couple days ago. And these are just the ones that are making the news. Really, 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 really can be painful. So this little thing is called I am a witness. Sorry, Tim. I'm walking away from the podium. <laughs> it's always there. That. 
That's called I am a witness. And what it is, it's an anti-bullying campaign. And you put that icon up. If you see someone on social media bullying someone, you just put that and you say, I got eyes on you. I'm watching you. I see what you're doing. This is awesome. This is kids. Kids are fighting back and saying, no, 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 no. I see. So that icon, that's what that means. So really what the most important part of this slide is, didn't cut it, Lynn, sorry, because I needed that pit paragraph. This is why I believe. Sorry, walking away now. This is what I believe the problem is. That's my personal opinion. It's not been proven. So I believe that the assumption, like bullying, like if you're bullied, like I was bullied in middle school, they beat the crap out of me every day. It happened behind the school. A few people know. What happens with this is that whether it's real or not, the perception is the entire world knows. This is the shame on a global level. So it's not just a couple kids in your school or a couple bullies. It's everybody. And that's what makes it harder because it's out there. And just remember for good digital citizenship, anything you write, post, or send is part of the digital universe. It is imprinted forever. Even if you delete it, it's available. So be careful, even about what you text. Just know, you put it out there. It's, it's in the lock box. So let's talk about social media. This is not what you do. Rule number one, do not confess to the murder of your boyfriend on Facebook. <laughs> what? I mean, come on. This is true. This happened. She got arrested. Yo, 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 I, I, I popped a cap at him. <laughs> That's the last time he's going to cheat on me with Dolores. <laughs> I popped a cap at her, too. Yes. She told her she stabbed her boyfriend. This is the only rule, right, people? This is it. And it used to look like this. Throwback Thursday, 1985. So, you like me. Sally Field has told us, you like me. You really, really like me. Okay, cool. Now it's this. But don't worry, good news. If you don't have followers, you can buy them. You can buy them on Instagram. Just go buy yourself a bunch of, of minions. Buy yourself a bunch of... Buy some Kardashian followers. <laughs> buy them. Yeah, I look really cool. I look balling because I have 17 million followers. It only cost me $18 million. I put it on my dad's credit card. Zuckerberg says he's going to get every human being online. He may do it. <laughs> Look at that kid's face. Walking away, Tim. Look at his face. There's no going back. Now, I know a little bit about nutrition. These kids' bellies are just, I want to give them all the sandwiches. But they all are starving. They're so busy on the iPad, they realize lunch is walking by right behind them. <laughs> that, whatever piece is like, cool, bro, I don't know, I'm so sick. Cool, hey, yo, what's up? <laughs> And then I get really sad because I have this weird brain where I think, and then someone, whoever gave that to him, took that away from the kid, and the kid is like forever going to be like, iPad. Oh. And this is why. This just happened. I got this yesterday. That is so super cool of them. Thank you. Wow, I feel like I'm really a part of a community of two billion people. Could everyone please give me a dollar? Everyone in my community, if you just gave me one dollar, I'm set. I'll write you a thank you text. So, yeah, that's, I got that yesterday. And I, actually, the dopamine squirt did happen. I did feel like I was a part of something really important in a movement that started in 2004. That obviously, because we do this, because we like things that we don't really like, but if we see some of our friends do, or some of the cool people do, we get all like, oh my God, well, this person liked it, and they're going to, I better like it too. And we all jump on that bad one. We find ourselves liking these are people we don't even like because other people did. And I'm feeling it here because I'm like, well, okay, so I'm so excited because I'm a part of this community of two billion people. This is true too. This was something I saw. Obviously, I took out her name. It's a woman. And she put that in and she says, I can't reply to anyone. Oh my word. And 29 people. I didn't put what they said. But tell me your honest opinion. This is what it's come to. We are no longer generating or building or going outside or doing whatever it takes to build the ego strength. We are determining, determining our self-worth and value from the external world of people we don't even know by likes, shares, retweets. That's what it's come down to. So tell me how opinion of me. I was like, I don't know. You drunk? Like, why?
Don't know what that is. That was something. Oh, I think that was the most important slide of all. Hang on. Mm, that figures. That's funny. I don't know what happened there. So this slide, which is now blank, is actually uh, became the thesis. I have a colleague who is supportive of what I do, and she. Um, this was her favorite slide, which you can't see. Basically, what this slide is, I'm going to read it to you because. Oh wait. See, I told you, Dr. Fong. Technological fail. I have it. I'm old school. I have the whole presentation. Aren't you glad you didn't have to listen to me do it all? All right, so here's what that slide said. It's really ironic that that's missing. Don't know what that means. Think about it later on. So what this slide said, do we contemplate the affect effect of our posts? Do we contemplate the affect effect our posts might have before we post? Do we contemplate the affect effect our posts might have before we post? Do we edit our posts? What is our real motive, goal, and agenda for posting or not posting? And if there's anyone in this room who has never posted a disingenuous post or hasn't disingenuously liked something that they didn't really like, you can you know and come back for Tim's, because we all do. So I'll call about something called social currency, which is the new currency. And we do it. And we find ourselves doing it, we feel a little bit of shame, but everyone does it, so okay, I'm gonna like that person's thing. Or we do reciprocal likes, like if someone really starts liking my stuff, I'll start liking their stuff. I hear. <laughs> FOMO versus JOMO. What is FOMO? Fear of, missing out. Fear of missing out. Oh my God, that's what my daughter had. When she, that beach trip. What's JOMO? Joy of missing, Joy of missing out. Seeing those pictures of my family reunion back home that I didn't have to go to. Look, wow, look at my cousin's wedding and everyone's all loaded back there. Ooh, I'm glad I wasn't there. I don't like it. I don't like fear of missing out. I don't like joy of missing out. I think it's real simple, people. I think it's called missing out. We're missing out because we're an absent presence. And we're all on our phones. We're missing out. Forget the Joe cares. Joe Mofomo, we forget about it. Remember, we only have a detention span of eight seconds. It's about missing out, and it's happened so fast. So this is what it's about, and this is all the work that I'm moving into next, and this is what, when I go to Washington, I'm gonna talk about, because digital citizenship is important because we don't realize what we're posting. For example, clinicians in the room, be super extra careful what you post, because even if you think it's blocked, people see it, and you don't want to be in a position where you post even a political view. Because if you have a client who has a different one, they're not going to trust you. So as clinicians and educators, what about this? How about if you work with a population that's a little sketch or a little what we used to call access to e in the wrong side of the access at that cluster and you got one of those antisocials or you got someone you work with a prison population and you're posting where your kids go to school and you piss that person off or you got a borderline and they know where you live and where you work. Be very careful. We don't think about this. You don't worry about it. You shouldn't have known it. That's what I'm talking about. This is all the work that me and the president of my division are doing now because her platform is digital citizenship. That's what my committee is looking at. I'm, going to be, I'm writing the protocols, just the suggestions for our population and everyone how to be careful. If you're on a social dating site, that's your business, but don't do it if you're a clinician or teacher under your own name because your clients will find you, find you because it happened. And I know a person, a clinician, probably it happened to, the client found them on a social dating site. Oh. That's cool, go on the date. No, non diplom use a different name. But be careful as clinicians, be careful as educators. Think about what you're posting. Thinking about, think about the information you're giving out to your clients. And if you work with a dangerous population, really think about it. How about that? And that's all there is to say about that, thank you, Forrest. <laughs> okay, these are our people, right, Lynn? These are our people. Oh, we love these knuckleheads, these millennials. Okay, born after 1984, surpassed. They just, they just became the largest living population last year. They are our minority, our majority. Hopefully that'll help us with elections. I didn't say that from the podium. But they're the biggest ones. They're the big ones. They came of age during a recession. Think about, think about these kids. Think about the psychology of these kids. They came post 9-11. They don't know anything about privacy. They came, they heard their parents talking about scary things like losing your house as they started to become through developmental stages. They, they grew up in an age when reality shows told you, oh, go to school, just go on American Idol, you become a star. 
You don't got to work very hard. They came into with media. There's so many pieces, if you really look at the millennials that we work with, of understanding them. But if you work with them, you have to know this stuff. You have to see where they are. You have to look at how they were raised. Think of the environment they came up in and everything that has changed for them. And that's the success of working with the teens and the adolescents. At least it seems to be for me. Lynn, would you agree? Yeah. You gotta know, you gotta go where they are. Go in their world. You cannot remain a digital immigrant. You gotta go, it's hard. Go become a digital native. But this is the stuff. Think about how they grew up. Think about the economy. Think about a black president. Think about all the stuff that was first for them, okay? So digital immigrants, that's us. Ooh, I read this to my kids. Good night, Moon. Okay. It's a real book. It's a real book. And I actually think it's funny, and I use it because I'm like, you need to put that iPad away and get some sleep, child, because you can't be up all night. That, that computer and that tablet should not be in your room like a baby monitor. You ain't got a baby. This is my cousin. I told her, don't do it. I was sitting right in front of her. She knows what I do. We were at a wedding. I said, don't do it, Kim. She did it. <laughs> my little cousin, Oliver, <laughs> it's over. He's like, that's all he, he's, that's all he wants. <laughs> They wonder why they don't trust us. They are super shady. They are sus AF. They are sketchy. That's their job. They're teenagers. It's just me sneaking out the window, coming home and like saying, good night, and then going in, oh, yeah. and then sneak out my window. Of course, of course they're supposed to do this. It's, they're teenagers. Nope. But this is a problem. Because here's my feeling about texting. So adolescents. 60. I, I don't know. I, think, I, I see my cell phone bill. I think I, either I got 20 kids I don't know about or my kids are sending like 6,000. I hope it's the latter. It would be cheaper. But they want to communicate this way. They don't want to talk on the phone. They don't listen to voicemails. My daughter's voicemail has been full for a week. I think it's been full since 2007. <laughs> you know it has because I tried to get it has. I think it's lazy. So what is a text? A text is basically, okay, well, I need some information, or I need to give you some information, but I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to hear story, story, story. I don't want to, I, I just need, to, I, I have no time for you. I just need to tell you something. So I'm just going to text you because I don't want to talk to you because it's going to take too much time. That's what a text is. It's basically a phone call. It's a phone call that most of the time I would send to voicemail. But it's just a text. So... The problem is, we suddenly have decided that a text is like 911. It's like Commissioner Gordon is calling the bat phone. Because I get a text, and I'm like, ooh. And I don't have my phone off because I didn't turn it off during the meeting. And it sits there and it gives me a nice little, ooh. And it's a text. Dopamine squirt to the brain. Someone's thinking about me. And I'm like, oh, and I shouldn't answer it because it's a meeting. Ooh, it's a meeting. Yeah, but I'm not really talking. They can't really see it. It's probably something really important because it's like a text. And they don't want to see something. See what's. And I'm like, oh, it must be something really. And it's my friend Nick, and he's like, yo, Don, what's up? <laughs> now I should put it away, but I'm like, sitting in a boring meeting. What's up? <laughs> Emoji face. Awesome. <laughs> Let the text go. We, we have it, but it's a Pavlov's brain thing. I don't know why. Maybe the neurologist can tell us why. We're looking at it. This fMRI stuff is really cool. We're getting to see all that stuff. But the self-esteem relationship is determined by response time. I do this thing with relationships. Where I, I teach this thing where I say basic relationships, in my opinion, is we teach people how to treat us. And they teach us how to treat them. And I believe that's the nature and the cornerstone of every relationship. And it's why we have different boundaries. Like some people, you know, you can be late for something too. Some people, you don't. Some people, you know, you can like, so I believe that. So I have taught people, I'm not going to reply, unless it's my kid. I'm not going to reply to a text immediately. I've taught people. I've also taught people they can call me at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm probably up. That's bad. But <laughs> I'm probably like putting up coffins in brains and something. But I've taught people, don't get all butthurt about it. But I'm busy. I have a lot to do. I will get to your text. But then I start getting like, you know, these people think text is like suddenly it's more than a phone call and they want information from me and, they're, and they'll text and then it'll be like, okay, I'm in session or I'm with people or I'm walk with my kids actually or I'm doing something and I'll start getting the like question mark, question mark because I didn't reply immediately to the question of what's up. 
question mark, question mark. I'm like, I'm, and then question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And like, are you dead? To which I, all, and I've had that. To which I need proof of life. Are you dead? To which I reply, yes, I am dead. Text back later. Good digital citizenship, people. You don't need to interrupt. The phone should not be on the table when you're with someone because then the person and the phone is on the table with you. Put the phone away. You don't need to have it on the table because if it's on the table, it's on the table and you're looking at it. Put it away if you're with someone. Don't answer, you don't have to answer a text right away. Go get over it. Teach them. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Went the wrong way. Okay, the gamers. Oh, it's a whole thing. It's a thing. It's a thing, these gamers. It's like when you're working with drug addicts and it's like you have like... You know, you have the alcoholics, and you have like the, the, the weed, I only smoke weed, and you have like the bends and the, and then you got the tweakers. It's like, it's a whole different thing. It's like, when you know it's a tweaker, you're like, okay, this is going to be something. <laughs> this is going to be, it's a tweaker, I got a tweaker. That's the gamers, it's a whole life, I do whole presentations on it. This is basically what it is, but what you need to know is that the game designers are purposely encouraged and they install little Easter eggs right before the, pers right before the end of levels. It's evil. They do it so the kid will keep playing. So the whole gaming thing, it's like a drug addict on a bad run. Don't neglect their personal hygiene. They're in their parents' basement for a week. They haven't eaten. It's bad. All kinds of bad things with gamers. This is what you do with the gamers. First of all, keep this stuff out of the bedroom. There's no reason it needs to be in the bedroom. Find other kinds of play. Use a timer. The parents should own the game. Don't let the kid buy it if it's a problem. Establish a routine. It's a whole thing. Come down boot camp. I'll tell you how to do it. Or you could do that. What? <laughs> <laughs> this is what's going to happen. Because augmented reality and virtual reality are already here. And once they become mainstream, it's done. People, I know I'm fighting a tsunami. I'm going to lose. Because even I, I've, been, I've had the goggles, and they're in their most sophomoric and, and nascent stages. They're the, they're the early goggles. They're like, it's the way we looked at those moon phones. Ooh. You know, we look at them now. Once augmented reality and virtual reality, and the difference is, is augmented reality means that you just augment the reality. So it means that we could do this room, and we're all wearing it. It will be contact lenses, and then the kids will probably just have them in their eye. Um, it means that I can take this room, and we can, I can have it. There's a beach there. Or there's butterflies, or unicorns flying, or there's like, you know, I don't know, anything I want. Anything I want can be in this room. So you can change the room. It's super cool if you have an office in a really dank building and you can just like put on the goggles for you and your client and suddenly you've got this really groovy office on the 17th floor of a penthouse in New York. Uh, Virtual reality is different. Virtual reality is immersion. It means that, like, you know, augmented reality just augments it. It's all a little softer. Who doesn't want to have that? Take the edges down. Uh, virtual reality means you're not here. You're in Vegas in a, you know, a casino and you're a baller. And you're, so that's the difference. But once they're here, who wants to live in this world if I can just make it a little nicer? Truth. Here are my samples. I want to thank all these people on here many more, and I want to thank you guys. And I apologize because I know this is brief, but I want to thank, because everyone in here, everyone on this list has done everything, something for me to support me, and I really appreciate that. Most of all, of course, sorry guys, my dog. So, I wonder sometimes, about the developmental stages and these kids. And I imagine these little four-year-old and five-year-old little beautiful children, boys and girls on a stage somewhere in their first ballet recital. And we all know how important it is to get the affirmation from the pack and certainly your parents, anyone who knows child psych knows that. So for attachment and all of this, it's important for bonding. So I imagine these children all sitting, uh, dancing and doing their first ballet recital and they look out and they look out to see the faces of mommy and daddy and what they see is the back of an iPad. And it looks like this because it's being recorded. It's being recorded so the parents can post it. A thousand people or 500 people or zero people 
will see the video, never look at the video, but say they like it because they want the people to like them and they want to show, or maybe someone else, another friend liked it, oh, I need, and they put that video of their kid up, they never watch it, it goes into an archive. Uh, my kid's in uh, Europe right now on a trip for school and she's taking pictures on a phone that she will probably never print out and hang on a wall because they're going to be in her phone. So she won't have pictures around her house. They'll be on her phone and she'll have them and capture them. But I wonder about the things like this because it makes me think that everyone that I work with and people that I know who aren't even clients are complaining that they, everyone feels disconnected, everyone feels dysfunctioned, everyone feels detached, everyone's looking for this community that I proved in my first research study is the most important thing to us as human beings and Aronson says we're social animals. So it scares me that we're becoming so disenfranchised and we're going to become more so when that goggles goggles and everyone I know is complaining I'm lonely, I don't feel like I have a community, I don't go out and do things and it looks like everybody else is doing things and my life sucks. And they don't realize that those other people have curated all of their social media to make it look like, I don't know, maybe their life is great. But I know that my life doesn't suck just because I'm not, you know, every weekend in Barcelona and at, you know, Madrid and then I'm at a concert. I know, but I know that everyone's complaining about their lack of community and I'm watching that in 17 years or however long we've had access to this, how fast it's happened, it scares me because I wonder what's gonna happen in the future because we're just becoming more and more disenfranchised, so where are we gonna connect? But how can that be wrong because, how can I be lonely because I have 2,200 Facebook friends, I have 19,000 Instagram followers, 20,000 of which I bought. Um, <laughs> I've got a Finsta. Anyone know what a Finsta is? Instagram, what's Finsta? What's your Finsta? Your Instagram is one. What's your Finsta? Oh, dude, you just sold everybody out. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> <laughs> a Finsta is like, you think your kids have an Instagram and they'll let you be a part of it? Yeah, they got a Finsta. The Finsta is the real one. It's for their friends. It's the... So I can have all these followers, all these likes, all this, and I see. And, but what am I doing on Saturday night? What am I doing on Friday? Who am I talking to? So that's the problem, and that's what I worry about. Thank you very much.